This morning, we're really going to be looking at just three verses in the, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, but I'd like to read for you verses 1 through 16. Again, you know, as, as I read the Bible, as you read the Bible, I hope you see if you've had the same experience that I've had in the past, that oftentimes what you hear in churches is not exactly the way that it is. And I just happened to be raised in one of those traditions that kind of missed it by a mile, you might say. But what's important is that we see what the Bible actually says and that we take it to heart and act upon it because this is for our well-being. It doesn't matter what any teacher says. It doesn't even matter what you believe. If it doesn't agree with Scripture, it's not going to do you any good. It's going to hurt you. You have to agree with what the Bible says. Well, let's see what our Lord Jesus Christ has to say about uh, suffering of this morning. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, He went up on the mountain. And after He sat down, His disciples came to Him. He opened His mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I do want you to notice that Jesus didn't say these things merely to His disciples. Uh, he said it to the crowds, but I mean, what I mean is not just His apostles. This wasn't just for them. But this is for everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ. This is what the Lord expects of us. And I also want you to notice when Jesus says, blessed are... And then he gives these various categories, for theirs is. He's not saying, blessed are you if you do this, this is what you're going to get. But he says, blessed are you if this is what you are. If this is what you are by the grace of God, because it shows that you belong to Him. All these things will be true of every believer. Although sadly, not in the degree that we would desire, but every true believer desires that he would grow in each of these particular characteristics that we would become more like our Lord Jesus Christ. But again, we're looking particularly at verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward in heaven is great. Now again, we've been looking at what will be true of you if you know Jesus. Now if you do know him, him, as we saw last week, you have among other things a desire that the lost would come to faith in Him. You would have a care and a concern that they would turn from their sins and trust in Jesus so that they wouldn't have to suffer for those sins for an eternity. You want them to come because you care about them. Remember when Jesus looked all around Him, 
and saw the people as sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. He looked ahead and he saw what was going to happen to them. He was concerned about their condition to the point where he was moved to do something about it. Now, you have this same concern if you know Jesus because you have the Spirit of God living within you. He is the Spirit of love, the Spirit of compassion, the Spirit of mercy. But again, we also recognize, I think you recognize as well as I, that we're only going to reach out to others to the degree that we are concerned about them. The Bible says you need to nurture that love that the Spirit of God has placed in you. You need to make it grow stronger to the point where it breaks through every single barrier to reach those who need to be reached with the gospel, your family, your friends, your neighbors. There are people all around you who are perishing, and some of them, perhaps many of them, for lack of knowledge, which means they just have never heard the gospel. And again, we can't sort of prejudge the situation. We know how they're going to respond to us. We know they're going to reject it, so why bother? We need to get it to them because that is how the Lord works. The message has to be preached to them. It has to be shared with them. It has to be given with them before He will work by His Holy Spirit. It doesn't just happen out of the blue. Now, again, this draws our attention to the fact that there are barriers to our reaching other people with the gospel. If there weren't barriers, we'd be sharing Jesus more than we do all the time with as many people as we possibly can, with as much, actually, as much as our time and our energy will allow us to do. Now, one of these barriers, and perhaps the greatest of these barriers, is fear, fear of a number of things, fear of how the person you're sharing with is going to respond, fear of being thought a fool and out of step with everyone else or being archaic or medieval, uh, fear of rejection, uh, that you're not going to do it perhaps well enough. Well, again, there's a lot of different things that... that can make us afraid and keep us from doing what it is we need to do. But fear is likely why you don't share the gospel, why I don't share the gospel more than we do. So how can we overcome this fear? Well, that's what I'd like to, to consider. Now, one way, as we saw in the evening, is knowing that God is going to be with you when you step out in faith and actually share the gospel because the blessings that God promises to you, He only promises to you if you're willing to obey Him. But what are those blessings? Well, protection for one thing, reward for another, particularly when you do this work because this is the, the main thing that God wants us to do in this world with our lives, to be living examples of the gospel, to be sharing Jesus Christ with others. That's what we saw last Lord's Day and last Lord's Day morning and evening. Now, this morning, we see another way to overcome fear, besides, of course, the fact God's going to be with us. And that's by learning to accept and even welcome what it is that we fear the most, and that is that we will suffer for doing what God calls us to do. Now, I've already told you the Lord is not telling you that you need to look for suffering, that you need to try to be persecuted by other people. You know, some of the early Christians believed so strongly in, in the fact that, you know, God tells us that those who are martyrs are more highly honored than anyone else. And so they thought, well, I'll just be martyred for the gospel. And so they began to line up at the Colosseum, virtually turning themselves in so that they would be killed, so that they would be eaten and torn apart by the lions, so that they would be honored by God. Well, it's nice to have that strong of a faith to know that those things are true, but that's not how the Lord wants us to act on this truth. He doesn't want us to say, or you know, again, put a bullseye on our chest and say, here I am, persecute me. Here I am, torture me. Uh, what He wants us to do is not to avoid obeying Him because we're afraid that we might actually have to suffer for Him. Now, Jesus says to you this morning, if you are persecuted for doing what's right, you're actually blessed. If someone insults you, if someone curses you, if someone does something nasty to you because you shared the gospel with them, 
that rather than feeling ashamed, you should rejoice and be glad because you are in very good company. That's the way they treated the prophets who were before you. And you should also rejoice because, he says, your reward in heaven is great, which means not only that you're headed to heaven, but that there is a reward for you, and that reward will be a great one. This morning, I want us to see that if you're going to serve Jesus Christ, you have to be willing to suffer because that is one of the costs attached to serving God. But I also want you to see that if you are going to be willing to suffer, you do have to look at suffering differently. You do have to see God's purpose behind it, and His purposes are always good ones. So first of all, if you're going to serve Jesus, you have to be willing to suffer because that is one of the costs involved in serving God. Now, again, as I mentioned before, this is shot through the Bible, and primarily we see it in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus had to go through from the time He entered into the world to the time He left it. He suffered. Now, we don't often think of this as suffering, but Jesus Christ actually suffered as a child under Herod. When Herod learned that there had been a king born and found out where the child was, he sent his soldiers to kill him. And that's why, of course, all the children two years and under were slaughtered in Bethlehem, and also why Jesus and uh, his parents, why his parents took Jesus and fled to Egypt, which would have created some measure of hardship even for Jesus as a child. He suffered by having to live among sinful men his entire life. Remember how Peter tells us that Lot's soul was tormented when he lived in Sodom, and he suffered because of what he saw and what he heard, and because he loved what was right and everything the people that were around him were doing, saying and doing was evil. Now, if Lot suffered because he had a righteous soul and he lived among wicked people, how much more did Jesus suffer just living even among those who called themselves God's people? Now, it's true that Jesus, the people Jesus was around weren't nearly as wicked as the Sodomites, at least in one respect. And yet Jesus says on one occasion, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah and the day of judgment than for these people. They're all wicked. But consider how much holier Jesus was than Lot and how much more He loved what was good and right than Lot did, which means how much more He suffered being around those people who did not love the Lord, did not speak of the things that honored the Lord, did not do the things that honored Him. He suffered by seeing and hearing ungodliness all around him. And of course, you know what that's like, at least to a degree, kind of like Lot, because knowing Jesus Christ and being like Him, you are also suffering by listening, hearing, by seeing the things that you see. Jesus Christ suffered in His ministry. You know, He suffered when He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. That's not a, a pleasurable thing to do. He suffered when He was afterwards tempted by the devil. Uh, there was a time when he was popular with the people and people were following him, but he was always hated by the religious leaders who did everything they could to accuse him and try to discredit him. Towards the end of his ministry, he was handed over to the Romans by the religious leaders and virtually the whole, all of Israel turned against him and called out for his blood. Jesus was mocked, he was scourged, he was crucified. He bore His Father's wrath on the cross. He died and was buried. Jesus suffered. He suffered for doing the will of God. Now, Jesus also reminds us that those who will follow Him will suffer, and so we're not surprised to see the disciples went through exact the same thing. Peter and John were arrested for healing a lame man. On one occasion, the one I just read in Scripture, all the apostles were arrested. They were threatened. They were flogged. They were released. Stephen was arrested, he was put on trial, he was stoned to death. Peter was arrested on another occasion, but released by an angel. James was killed by the sword. Of course, many others were put to death by Saul. He had orders from the chief priest to drag anybody who named the name of Christ to prison. They were put on trial, and when they were put to death, he cast his vote against them. 
Saul himself, of course, who became the Apostle Paul, went through a myriad of sufferings. There's one chapter in 2 Corinthians where he gives us a list, I think it's in chapter 9, of all the things he had to endure. For doing what? For sharing the gospel among God's people, the Jews, who rejected it and hated him for so doing. John the Apostle was exiled. And again, it was all because they were serving the Lord. Now, many of the early Christians were killed in the Roman persecution, as I've already mentioned. Many of them were thrown to the lions. Uh, those who were used most powerfully by the Lord through the centuries suffered a great deal, and many died. I mean, just take, for example, those who suffered in, in the cause of the Reformation. You know, we saw just four men, some pre-Reformation figures and some Reformation figures. What happened to Wycliffe for just wanting to preach the gospel and translate the Bible into the language of the people so they could simply read the gospel? He was hated. He was put on trial. He was condemned. They would have burned him at the stake if they could have acted quickly enough and if he didn't have the right people to protect him. They did later dig up his bones and burn them because they couldn't burn him while he was still living. Huss was actually arrested, put on trial, condemned, and burned at the stake. Uh, Luther also was put on trial. He was condemned. He was excommunicated. He was declared an outlaw. His works were publicly burned. Everywhere he went, his life was constantly in danger. Although God preserved him to the end of his life, it wasn't an easy life. Uh, Tyndale, as you know, was condemned. He was strangled. He was burned at the stake. And of course, there were many other people who suffered as well. We saw John Frith, for instance, and and others. They suffered because they were just seeking to bring the gospel to others. They suffered because they were trying to advance the kingdom of heaven. They were just trying to love other people and bring the gospel to them. So why were they hated for this, you know, for doing this? Well, again, Jesus tells us it's because the world hates Him and the world hates His gospel. And of course, Jesus tells you that if you're going to serve Him, that you are going to be hated as they were hated. You are going to be hated as He was hated. You cannot know Jesus Christ and become like Jesus Christ and do His work without suffering hatred by the world. Jesus says in John 15 verses 18 through 21, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world. But I chose you out of the world because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. You see, if you're going to do the work of Christ, if you're going to live like Him, become like Him, do what He would do, you're going to be hated. Now this, as I mentioned before, is one of the main reasons why we hesitate. In doing what the Lord calls us to do, in sharing the gospel with more people than we do, because we know the cost that is involved, and we're just not willing to pay it in many of these cases. So if we're going to serve Him, we are going to suffer. So how can we break through that barrier? What can we do? Well, I would suggest this morning what we need to do is we need to see suffering in a different light than the way we see it now. We need to see it in its true light. You need to see God's purpose behind suffering. It is a good purpose. When you do, when you do actually understand it, it may change the way that you look at it and it may actually free you up to do what the Lord calls you to do. So how should you look at suffering? Well, first of all, you need to realize that it is the norm. Okay, that is the norm. That is the way it is. That's basically what you signed up for. When you picked up your cross to follow Jesus Christ, that's what you were agreeing to do, is to suffer for Him. And so that's what you are to expect. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. <laughs> 
this is the way it is. This is what you should expect. This is what the Lord told you in advance. Jesus told you to expect it. This is what He went through. This is what His disciples went through. This is what you're going to go through if you serve Him. That's just simply the way it is. That's the norm. But secondly, that's why you should also see it as a mark of His ownership on you because it is the norm for those who belong to Jesus. It is the norm for those who are becoming like Jesus. And if that is the norm for those who follow Him, then when you experience it, you can know that you actually belong to Him and that you will receive His kingdom. In our passage this morning, we read in verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you do what is right and you suffer for it, it shows you that you are an heir of the kingdom of heaven. Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 14, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests on you. It's one of the ways you can know the Spirit of God is with you and that He is making you like Jesus when you do what Jesus does and you suffer for it. So understood in this way, you shouldn't be afraid if you have to suffer because you, you realize that that is the norm, but it's the norm for the Christian. And when you suffer it, you can know that you belong to Him. Well, thirdly, it's a privilege, as we've already seen, to suffer for Jesus Christ. I mean, Paul told us that it is a privilege that is actually granted by God to those who know Him. Philippians 1, verses 29 through 30 in our meditation, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Now, again, as I mentioned before, a grant is something that is good. It's not a bad thing. When the disciples were arrested, when they were flogged, when they were threatened, they didn't go back to their homes murmuring and complaining and saying, you know what, I don't remember. I'm never going to go through that again. I'm not going to stand up for Jesus again. I mean, look at what He did to me. He put me to public shame. I was beaten publicly. I'm never going to go through that. No, they didn't do that. But rather, Luke writes in Acts 5.41, they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for His name. You see, that's a grant. That's a good thing. That actually meant not only that they were believers, but... <laughs> That, they, that Jesus considered them worthy actually to stand in His place and to suffer in His place for His cause. Now, Paul basically saw suffering the same way. He said to the Galatians in Galatians 6, 17, from now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. I mean, we usually wince when we get a scar. Oh, I've been disfigured for life. Paul was a museum piece of scar tissue from all the beatings he had taken. And he looks at those and he says, these are the brand marks of Christ. These show that I belong to Him. And he gloried in those things. He said to the Colossians, now rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of His body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, he doesn't mean by that that Jesus didn't suffer enough for your salvation. He suffered enough. But what he means is the world, when they had killed Jesus, they, they didn't vent all their anger and all their hatred. They had to do more. And so Paul says, I'm helping to fill up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions by taking on myself what was meant for him. And his response to it, I rejoice in my sufferings. For your sake. And so another reason why you should see suffering in a different light is because it is a privilege, not only the norm, it's not only a mark of ownership, but it's actually a privilege that God grants to His children whom He knows can bear it. at least that degree of suffering. We all will suffer to some degree. Now fourth, suffering is also a sacrifice. 
that God will reward. I mean, look at what we saw again in Matthew 5, verses 11 and 12. Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Lord says He's going to reward you for everything you do for Him, but especially He's going to reward you for suffering. When you suffer, your reward is great. You know how Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 that we need to be careful what we build on the foundation which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, and how we can build on it precious stones, gold, and wood, hay, and stubble. This is precious stone. This is gold. This is something that will remain, and your reward for this will be great. Well, finally, you should look at suffering differently because suffering is necessary for you to grow in godliness. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 12, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, uh, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. By the way, when he said to Timothy, you followed me in these things, he was following Paul as, fo as Paul followed Jesus. He wants you and me to follow that example as well because that is the example of Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice Paul says here, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Certainly this means that if you live godly, you're going to be persecuted as we've already seen. But I think it also means this, that if you want to be godly, if it's really your desire to live godly, that God will bring persecution. He will bring suffering because that is the way that He helps you to grow. That's the way He does it. James writes this in James 1, verses 2 through 3. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You know, I, I used this as an example once before, but again, it's very appropriate here. During a missions conference at, at college, uh, there, were these, uh, there was this one keynote speaker who spoke through the entire week, and the man had, uh, his name was Joseph Tan, and he was from Romania. He was a Baptist minister who had been persecuted for seeking to bring the gospel to, well, to the people of Romania, seeking to get the Bible printed and distributed. He suffered a great deal, and I'll tell you what, when he was speaking to us, he was so intense and earnest. There was absolute silence and focus on this guy. You could hear a pin drop. Well, I, I mentioned that because the persecution he went through, the suffering he went through, made him to grow in his spirituality, his maturity, and his intensity in serving the Lord. And we had a, a marvelous contrast, although it was kind of a sad contrast, when uh, during that, that missions week, somebody else got up who... I think he had just finished his degree at Christian Heritage. He was going on the mission field, and he got up to speak. And I'll tell you what, it was quite a different thing watching him versus listening to Joseph Tan. I mean, literally, the guy almost looked like he was a clown compared to Joseph Tan because of the difference in their character. God helps you to grow this way. This is how He makes you useful is through persecutions and sufferings. And that really shouldn't surprise us because... That's the way God actually uh, perfected His Son, Jesus Christ, through His sufferings. And if He's going to do that to Jesus, that's how He's going to teach you. The author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 2.10, For it was fitting for Him for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus Christ wasn't perfect. 
But what it means is as a man, he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He actually matured, as it were, in certain respects into that person who could be our great high priest. And the way that God trained him was through his sufferings. So suffering is one of the ways in which God causes you to grow. It's necessary for your spiritual growth. And so again, back to our purpose. Ask yourself this morning, why don't you share the gospel more than you do? Is it because you're afraid? Is it because you're afraid of suffering? Well, you need to see that suffering is inevitable, isn't it? It's a part of God's plan. You need to see that far from being something to be ashamed of, it's actually His mark of ownership upon you and something you should glory in. It's a privilege that God actually grants to you that you would be considered worthy to stand in His Son's place and to take the abuse that the world means to give Him. And that is also, by the way, the reason why He will reward you for enduring it. Remember that Jesus also had to suffer, that He might be perfected, that He might be equipped to serve as your high priest. This is how the Lord equips you, that He might or that you might serve Him better. So don't let suffering get in the way of your serving the Lord, but rather embrace it. <laughs> embrace it as a part of His plan to make you more like Jesus Christ, because that is how He does it. May the Lord give us grace to receive what He's told us this morning. Let's bow in a few moments of prayer and pray that the Lord would apply it.